Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Battle of Amiens in 1918. Um, it's Considering its importance and significance, it's immensely overlooked. And most of the focus, particularly here in Britain, um, of uh, on World War I battles is on the Somme uh, in France. Most likely the, the main focus is on Verdun. Um, and the, and, but Amiens itself is arguably of, of greater significance than both those, those, those battles. So in order to explain Amiens, we actually kind of need to go back to the, the kind of the crisis year of 1916, where uh, the German army uh, attacked Verdun uh, relentlessly uh, in order, um, as uh, General Erich von Falkenhayn put it um, in his uh, letter to the Kaiser the, the previous year on uh, grand strategy, to, to bleed France white. Uh, Verdun has an almost uh, sacred uh, quality um, to uh, French nationalism and uh, French patriotism, and uh, the French were willing to defend Verdun to the last man. And the, the Germans knew this, and they believed that they could put almost intolerable pressure on the French army and intolerable French pressure on the French Republic and cause it to um, collapse uh, under the, the, the weight of, of losses. The uh, Falkenhayn said that essentially if France collapses, Britain will uh, give up. And if they, Britain don't, we can continue to strangle the British Isles using uh, U-boats. So this seemed like a... Uh, uh, a good strategy. Uh, as far as Falkenhayn was concerned, the war on the East was all but won. He hadn't really reckoned with a, uh, a rejuvenated, renewed Russian offensive in 1916. He thought that the uh, the, the, the Russians, uh, after the battles of the Masurian Lakes and the Battle of Tannenberg, were, were all but done. So, as we know, uh, the uh, Verdun is a stalemate for um, Germany. And the series of concentric battles, the Somme being one of them, and the Brusilov offensive on the Eastern Front being another, designed to um, squeeze Germany um, into uh, surrender and along with their ally um, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria. Um, these are um, stalemates as well. The Germans are, um, and the Austro-Hungarians are able to um, hold the line, uh, as are the Turks, um, effectively, and there is uh, no collapse. The Somme uh, is, a, uh, in the eyes of um, modern revisionist historians on the Somme, uh, not so much the re result of uh, you know, British lions led by donkeys, um, a, a much debunked idea now. Uh, namely because the term was made up by um, historian and Tory party cad Alan Clark and he later admitted that it was uh, an invention because it sounded good Gary Sheffield um, for example um, has uh, written various books on uh, the Somme and on Hague and suggests that whilst Hague may have been uh, an inflexible and arrogant man, um, he, Rawlinson and the other generals, were on something of a learning curve. They had a, a huge, very new, untested uh, army, um, and a, a flood, from 1916 onwards, a floods of um, or conscripts um, pouring in, and they um, had less understanding than they needed and a great inflexibility uh, about how to win uh, a modern battle against the Germans. And by 1918, it's clear that uh, Amiens sort of makes Gary Sheffield's point, I think, that by 1918, that the lessons have been learned. There's uh, another year of crisis in 1917, which will for the purposes of brevity, have to skip over rather. And by we get by the time we get to 1918, the flexibility um, that is required to win a modern battle uh, is that the Germans have always used a practice 
called Alftrag's tactic, which means that um, the field marshals set the, the big strategic picture of cities to be captured and resources to be seized, and then leave it to divisional commanders and uh, more lower-ranking generals on the ground to figure out how that's done and to improvise and to react to local conditions uh, and to uh, avoid the, the kind of the doctrinal rigidity um, that stifles armies. Hitler, obviously, by after 1941, reverses all of this and believes that he is unstoppable and inflexible um, and, again, in, in introduces this rigidity where only he, the great genius commander, can tell anyone what to do. Um, and as a result, there are, um, you know, a working system breaks down. The, the, the British... Uh, kind of suss the, 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 the German way of doing things and um, uh, adopt it and uh, adapt it. And the other thing that they managed to do before the Battle of Amiens is they managed to uh, conceal effectively their preparations. The problem with the Battle of the Somme, or one of the many problems with the Battle of the Somme, is that the Germans knew full well that the British were coming. The um, the British believed that they had um, concealed the building of new roads and railway lines and supply dumps and uh, field hospitals and all these kinds of things uh, up to the front line. But German spotter planes had managed to, uh, to see this. Um, so in the spring of 1918, uh, Erich von Ludendorff, uh, Hindenburg's deputy, plans and launches a, uh, a series of um, surprise attacks in the West, uh, the, the Ludendorff Offensive. These five um, surprise attacks have, uh, they're close to achieving their goals of separating the British and the French army, forcing the British back to the coast and um, forcing uh, essentially a Dunkirk-style re-embarkation. And the Admiralty is giving this serious thought um, by uh, about May 1918. Um, the belief that the generals on the Allied side, the British, French and American generals had in 1918 was that war would easily last until 1920. And Ludendorff um, believed that his second objective uh, to capture Paris was one that was, uh, was in sight. However, Ludendorff was um, something of a gambler. He managed to strip the German army of its best soldiers um, that he put into uh, essentially frontline shock battalions and stormtrooper storm um, divisions, which were then flung at Allied trenches. Um, many of the many Allied trenches were overrun. Um, Seventy thousand British prisoners were taken within the first week of the spring offensive. But the cost to the German army was immense. Not only were um, the, the you know, a great number uh, of these uh, frontline troops lost, but the ability of the German army to replace them is um, almost exhausted. Essential equipment such as artillery pieces, uh, horses and uh, uh, munitions themselves uh, along with all the um, logistics that you need to keep an army moving, uh, are worn out in this one last desperate, desperate gamble. Ludendorff believed this was essential because of the uh, introduction of America into the war. Um, the possibility of millions of fresh troops arriving in Europe uh, was something that the Germans knew they couldn't contend with. It was impossible. And they knew that the productive power of the USA, uh, the industrial power of the USA, would grind Germany into, into dust. So one last bid to win, to deal um, the Americans that had arrived in Europe, such a, a, a bloody lesson that they would uh, think twice about taking on Germany. Um, this was uh, the kind of the, the last roll of the dice, and always with these sorts of gambles, it either works perfectly or not at all. There's no uh, middle ground really. There was no opportunity for the Ludendorff offensive to partially succeed, and the Ludendorff offensive, once it runs out of steam without fully having defeated 
the Allies, the um, Supreme Allied Council becomes convinced under uh, the French General, French Field Marshal Foch, who is the Supreme Allied Commander um, from 1918 onwards, that the, there's a, a historic opportunity to end the war has arrived. When the Germans are finally forced back at the Second Battle of the Marne, um, Foch calls together shortly afterwards um, a meeting of Haig himself, uh, General John Pershing of the uh, American Expeditionary Force, and uh, Patan, the later collaborator with Nazi Germany and ruler of Vichy France, but at this point a uh, field marshal and a figure of immense popularity and uh, an expression of, uh, of national pride. So Foch points out to the other generals that uh, the Germans are now on the back foot and they have got a, a shortage of men, of munitions, on, on of everything. And that the opportunity for the offensive that uh, Foch had always hoped for has arrived. Haig and Foch had already talked about the possibility of an offensive um, in May that year. But when the fourth, the British Fourth Army, uh, led by Sir Henry Rawlinson, um, were uh, probed German defences using raids led by um, Australian soldiers and um, American uh, soldiers who were serving under the uh, overall command of the Fourth Army, it became clear that German defences were incredibly weak. Surprisingly so, uh, in fact. The thing that seems to have vanished from the German army is morale. Um, the German soldiers who had replaced those who had been killed in um, Ludendorff's spring offensive seem to um, have been uh, reluctant to uh, fight in the way that German soldiers had fought in the first uh, three years of the war. And they were less experienced soldiers, so uh, taking the risks necessary to repair uh, defences, barbed wire, um, to uh, dig gun emplacements and that sort of thing, um, these kinds of things are not being done. So the, the, the um, German trenches are becoming increasingly poorly defended. And this is really, really significant. It shows that the, the German army, after the experiences of 1916, which were are widely seen as a kind of a British tragedy at the Somme, but were equally, um, uh, equally uh, traumatic and terrifying and bloody for the Germans. And also... F um, the experience of, experiences of early 1918, where the Ludendorff offensive that was hoped to win the war finally peter out. Many, many German soldiers at this point have lost heart. They've, they've, they've given up. And the, um, the rest of the Battle of Amiens tends to suggest this, as we shall see. Aware that German morale was suffering um, from prisoners um, taken back to Allied trenches in raids, and uh, aware also that the German army was uh, threatening the railway between Paris and Amiens, Foch, um, Haig and Pershing, and also Haig's um, deputy Rawlinson, believed that um, a limited attack at Amiens would be um, would achieve two goals. It would protect the railway, and also it would de uh, deal a major blow to German army morale. And it, can, it seems clear that the generals saw um, the dent to German morale as a, a key objective. The thing that went in their favour was that um, before Amiens was a large, dry, flat plain that was relatively uncrated, and so you could drive um, tanks across there. Now, they only chug along at about eight miles an hour, and a large number of them would be knocked out by German guns. But tanks were the Allies' critical advantage at this phase. Another key advantage that existed was the fact that the British, by 1918, using sound ranging and aerial photography, were able to actually pinpoint where enemy guns were. And this was uh, ideal for artillery. It meant that 
having a uh, an artillery uh, attempt to destroy enemy trenches and, and German concrete bunkers, which the Somme had shown was virtually impossible. Some of the German bunkers were uh, 40 feet below ground and uh, were impenetrable um, to British shells. Um, the fact that the Somme Britain had used mainly uh, shrapnel shells to which kill men on the surface and not high-explosive piercing shells um, was probably part of the problem. Anyway, being able to destroy the enemy's guns with with accuracy um, was a, a a clear advantage, um, and the uh, movement of guns up to the front line, as I mentioned before, was done with immense secrecy. One of the methods for doing it was to dampen the noise of of gun movement, so straw was laid on the roads, and uh, lorries pulling uh, guns had rope wrapped around their wheels um, the the noise obviously of an entire army moving is uh, very very noticeable um, to enemy forces that are really not that far away the germans were used to uh, the british beginning their um, campaigns bringing their, their their great offensives with days of uh, artillery bombardment. The, the Somme had seen um, terrific uh, bombardment of German trenches. So the British refrained from doing this before Amiens. Um, they make sure that the, the level of um, shelling is no higher than would normally be experienced. And this has uh, an immense effect on the ability of uh, Britain to take the uh, German army by surprise. There are a number of German missed opportunities. Um, the day begins with a, a, a bombardment from the British and when the uh, assembled Allied forces form up to attack, they present a very attractive uh, target, uh, a, a mass, uh, a close mass of infantry and tanks that um, a, a German artillery counter-bombardment would devastate, but this never comes. When the um, uh, the the Allied attack begins, within hours there are thousands of German uh, surrenders. The Allies use low lying mist and smoke shells to hide themselves, um, and when they um, uh, attack, they use armed cars and, and faster tanks in order to uh, speed up the the pace of the attack, the the momentum. So the speed of uh, Allied movements on the first day, on the 8th of August 1918, uh, was hugely important. The sp attack slows down uh, on the 9th, and Germany begins to move reinforcements up to the line. And by the 11th of August, the uh, offensive had slowed down um, because of the ability of the German army, which is one of its great kind of uh, attributes, was to dig in in machine gun nests and defensive positions and to uh, make any further gains uh, far too bloody uh, to consider. So by the uh, 11th, the um, uh, combined wisdom of uh, Rawlinson Monash, who was the head of the um, Anzac uh, forces uh, on the Western Front, and Curry, the um, head of the Canadian Army, um, decided that there was um, nothing to be gained from a, a further offensive. But if you look at the statistics, the Allies had lost um, 20,000 British soldiers and 24,000 French, um, and captured 29,873 uh, prisoners and nearly 500 guns. Total German casualties were something like 75,000, um, of which 33,000 were missing and prisoners. So it was a, a huge proportion. Um, and the um, impact of, the, of Amiens in terms of territory and men was actually less than the Second Battle of the Marne. But the impact was much, much greater on the morale of the high command. It was the 8th of August 1918 is what Ludendorff famously refers to as the Black Day of the German army. And there are countless reports from British soldiers and um, official British dispatches 
of Germans surrendering without any fighting. So the question is, I mean, who really wins or loses the Battle of Amiens? Um, certainly generals like Foch choose the right moment to attack and the conditions are uh, precipitous to victory. Um, however, it seems to me that the, the greatest cause of German defeat at uh, Amiens was probably Ludendorff and he had created the conditions for a defeat long beforehand during the spring offensive. Um, the exhausted, demoralised um, and unwilling to soldier on uh, German troops um, surrendering in droves strongly suggests that. And this was the lesson that the Kaiser drew from Amiens as well. Ludendorff offered um, his defeat, his resignation to Hindenburg, which was uh, rejected. Um, and the other thing that Hindenburg rejected was advice to withdraw to the Siegfried Line, to the borders of Germany, and to um, simply defend the, the Reich from invasion. There would be a, a shorter front line to defend and more, more troops in order to reinforce it, and obviously the assumption that German troops would fight to the end to keep ally, um, Allied troops off their soil. Wilhelm II, uh, the Kaiser, was uh, briefed on the 10th of August uh, by Hindenburg, and the, the main thing that comes out of that meeting is that troop morale has collapsed, um, that it is um, no longer certain that Germany will win the war, or that Germany's soldiers will continue fighting the war. Now, to place this in context, uh, the um, October previous, or the February previous, um, the Kaiser's cousin, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, had really been swept away when he'd lost control of the army, and um, the results for, for Russia had been catastrophic. The Kaiser is acutely aware of what a, a mutinous army, a disenchanted and angry um, army, unwilling to obey, or obey orders, can mean for somebody like him. And on hearing the news of Amiens, he said, We are at the end of our effectiveness. The war must be ended. The evidence tends to suggest that um, what was guiding Wilhelm's considerations were, uh, was as much domestic concerns as it was uh, military ones. The idea that um, the war must be ended quickly wasn't, really, wasn't so much based in um, Wilhelm's acceptance that the big strategic goals um, of German militarism uh, were no longer going to be met, but that enormous risks to Germany itself, not just of invasion, but of revolution were around the corner. A defensive strategy, it was believed, making the Allies pay for every inch of uh, land that they uh, they, they took, um, was hoped that it could bring the Allies to the negotiating table and that talk of unconditional surrender by Germany could be avoided. But added to this, the scaling down of Germany's war aims uh, simply to the defence of Germany uh, was now high on the priority, so much so when the uh, Austrian High Command visited Germany at Spa um, on the 12th in order to ask for a resumption of offensive actions, obviously with large numbers of German troops to support them, the answer was no. Um, the um, two generals who met them, obviously Hindenburg and Ludendorff, so the, the possibility of a decisive blow or decisive victory does not exist. And that now simply um, peace feelers to the Allied powers needed to be put out. So Amiens, um, if we look at it, um, it from start to finish really, wasn't the death blow to the German army militarily, but in morale terms and in political terms it spells the end of the war. So Amiens is a greatly overlooked battle, um, by and large, and full credit to the uh, generals Foch, Haig, 
Pershing, Monash, Curry and others, uh, more than some, um, is often ignored here with the, the kind of the shadow of the Somme really um, taking up um, most of the kind of the, the, the mental energies of uh, people that think about the, the First World War. Anyway, a couple of quick announcements before we finish. You can find my regular blog on the Huffington Post and now monthly on the IB Taurus uh, book review blog. We'll be doing more reviews with IB Taurus later in the month. And thanks very much. We've started to have some donations for um, the hosting of the podcast. Some money's towards that. But obviously, um, any um, any donations that we can attract all goes to keeping this podcast free and independent and coming to you every single week. Anyway, thanks very much for listening, and I'll speak to you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Bye-bye.